My name is Attila Toff. I've been married for 14 years and attending CCV for 10. The typical week, I'll, I'll have three or four teams that I coach at uh, CCV through uh, it's either the STARS program or the United. Three of them are soccer teams and uh, one flag football team. I have uh, church on Sunday. I have uh, a men's transformation group on Wednesday mornings. The past year, I've gone on uh, two mission trips, both to Kenya. At the end of the day, um, you know, I'm, I'm always running. Besides being a, a father and a husband and a coach, uh, my day job I work as a real estate broker and a, and a loan officer. Uh, yeah, yeah, what we have, yeah, what we have now is sufficient. So yeah, we attended CCV for uh, several years before we were invited to a neighborhood group. Uh, one of our neighbors uh, just reached out to us and just did a friendly invitation uh, to come over and uh, spend some time, meet some of the neighbors. Uh, learn more about the Bible, and, uh, and, and I think he mentioned to me that there's dessert, so that might have gotten me to go. Uh, I, I think I was at first hesitant of how am I going to add another thing to my, my busy schedule, but Aaron and I were talking that it's something that we, uh, we needed to do to learn more about the Bible, and once we reprioritized and moved some uh, items around, it became real easy. When I have to make a decision, the question I ask myself is what's, uh, what's the most important and, uh, and then I can determine um, which way we go. But uh, for me, being all in uh, is, is comprised of going to church every week, going to neighborhood group every week. If somebody asks me to go to the football game but, it, but it's on a Sunday and I'm going to church with my family, then I, I choose the, the spending time with my family going to church. My day is a controlled chaos. Uh, it, it, and, uh, but I'm able to focus on what's important and, uh, and, and, and everything else fits around that. One, one of the challenges that uh, I've had when I've asked people to go to neighborhood group is they say they're busy, they don't have time in their schedule. And so when I reflect on, on myself on a personal basis, I just enjoy it. I find there's so much benefit for me. Why, would I, why wouldn't I go? I know what some of you are thinking as you're watching that video. Is that really possible? Can a person really run a successful business, coach two or three nights, your kids' sports, make church a priority every weekend, have a men's discipleship group, and also be committed to a neighborhood group every week? He does that. And the question is, how in the world is he able to keep that kind of balance in his life? Because if we're honest... Almost all of us on all of our campuses, we struggle with finding balance in our lives. It's a tension that we deal with each and every day. So here we are. Summer's almost over. Uh, vacations are done. Uh, kids are back in school. After school activities and sports keep us going almost every night. As a family, we wish we had some time to have a meal together. One or both of our parents are very committed to their careers. And instead of relaxing on the weekends... We find ourselves juggling the NFL, youth sports, our own personal time, and going to church. We probably feel like our life is one continual long treadmill that we can never get off of. How can we get balance in our lives so that we don't go over the edge? The Bible has some incredible practical advice that will help us. It's found in Psalm 37. Listen to what it says. Do not fret. In other words, don't worry because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. In other words, what the, the writer is saying is, for those of you that are Christ followers, and you say, this is not paying off. Other people are living wild, uh, evil lives, and look how God's blessing them. He said, just wait till the end. Wait and see what stands up. Now, that's what he says. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He also says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still, there it is, before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. In this passage, I believe we find four keys to help us find balance in life, and I try to visual this myself as like one continual circle, meaning we get up every day and we make commitments to God, and once we make those commitments, then we trust 
God to work in those commitments. We see him work, and then we delight in what he's doing in our lives, and then we're able to go to bed and rest and be still, and then we get up the next morning and commit more and trust more and delight more and rest more. It's one continual cycle. I believe that finding balance begins with commitment. Now, why is that? Because commitment gives stability to life. See, I believe everything in life begins with commitments. If you're beginning a career, what you're trying to say is, what's the expectations of the job? Or what's the job requirements I've got to commit to? Or if you're buying a car, what's the commitment? You've got to sign the contract. If you're becoming a Christian, the commitment is you're obedient to the Lord in baptism. You die to yourself and say, I want to live for you and put you first. If you're married, what's the commitment? You share your vows. You sign your name on a marriage license. Married couple was having problems in their marriage. Uh, They were having trouble communicating because the husband would try to talk and the wife would interrupt him and just keep talking. They decided to go to a marriage counselor and they went in to see the marriage counselor. They sat down and the marriage counselor said, what's the problem? And the husband began to share the problem and the wife interrupted him and just kept talking. Finally, the counselor got up from behind his desk, walked around, put his hands on the wife's face and gave her a kiss right on the lips. She was speechless. He went back and sat down. The counselor said to the husband, you see, that's all she needs. And the husband said, how often does she need that? And the counselor said, she needs it about three times a week. And so the husband said, okay, I I think I can bring her in on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. (laughs) Ladies, that's about how clueless we are, all right, on some of those things. Commitment gives stability to life. Why are so many successful people lacking balance in their lives today. We look at movie stars, we look at athletes, we look at successful businessmen and businesswomen. They seem very successful in the eyes of the world and yet they crash and burn. Why is that? Because they lack a moral compass that gives them stability. They've not put God at the center of their lives. They might even call themselves Christians, but they are still putting themselves at the center of their lives. Why does our society lack balance today? I believe because no longer as a society have we put God at the center of things. Now stop and think about that. As, as parents, you want your kids to be educated and successful, so what do you do? You send them all to, off to college, and they basically study the creature. They take courses in anatomy, anthropology, and psychology. They study courses in how to be creative. They take art and music and writing and dance. Then they take courses in the creation. How's the world put together? Astronomy and geology. And we would say that's all you need to be successful. And yet we leave out the very core of life and learning and education, which is a study of the creator, which is theology. And we wonder when we've removed the most important thing in education out of our educational system and our country, we wonder why we're out of balance. Stop and think about this country as it began. Some of the leading universities, Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Princeton, those colleges were started by Christian denominations and churches that wanted to say the key to quality education is the understanding of God at the center of everything. Commit your way to the Lord. How in the world does commitment give stability to life? Well, you see, your commitments reflect your values. What you're committed to reflects what you really value. The Bible puts it this way. It says, seek first, circle the word first, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, all these things that we worry about in life We're out of balance because we haven't put God's kingdom and living the way God wants us to first. You see, your commitments are reflected by how you spend your money and how you use your time. And so if I could look at your checkbook, if I could look at your calendar or or your day timer, whatever you have, or your appointment book, those two things would tell me what you value, value and what you think is important. 2014 George Barna survey just came out, and it reflected the changing values and habits of Christians who worship. Christians used to go to church three out of four weekends a month. Let's say that's almost 35 weekends out of the year. But now Christians go once every four to six weeks. Do you get that? 
We used to go 35 weeks a year. Now Christians are going 10 weekends out of 52. Do you see the change in values? Is it any wonder that we often feel out of balance? Studies also are showing that millennials, the younger generation, just leaving home and college, that they are the group that's leaving the church in the highest numbers. But just last month, a new study come out, came out that really caught us completely off guard. It says now the largest group that is now disenfranchising from church is baby boomers. 41% are checking out of church because if we're not careful, many people that have gone to church, even as baby boomers, Jesus and God in the church was a part of their life. It wasn't central to their life. Or maybe they served and they say, hey, I've already done my time. I've already done what I supposed, I've already served, now I'm going to live and do my thing. The study also found that parents are the single most important predictor of a young adult's attitude toward religion and the church. I want to repeat that, because often we think it's peers, it's movies, it's, it's the media. No, parents, Christian parents, you are the single most important person in whether your children are going to grow up and love the church or Jesus Christ. You see, your commitment reflects your values. And your values are often caught more than taught. A lot of you may be new to CCV, have never heard me share this, but years ago I shared this. Uh, My son is in his early 40s right now, but when he was in about the seventh grade, he had played competitive soccer, and in the seventh grade, they had a very good team he was on. They won the state championship. They played in Europe that summer. They played in tournaments uh, all over western part of the United States that year in the seventh grade. In fact, we began to look at the end of the season, and he had missed almost 18 to 20 Sundays in that competitive soccer team because of all the tournaments they were involved in. And my wife and I sat down and talked, and we said, you know what? We have a values conflict in our family because what we've told him is important, and what we're allowing him to do is totally inconsistent. And so I made one of the hardest decisions I probably ever made as a parent. I sat him down and said, we're taking you out of competitive soccer. Because you see, we believe the church has got to be first. And you've missed almost 20 weeks. And we're really saying to you that soccer is more important than the Lord. And so, I'm sorry, we're taking you out. Now, I told you it was the most difficult decision I probably ever made as a parent. But I can look back now and tell you it was one of the best decisions we ever made. You know why? It reinforced the consistent values of which we had raised our son to that point. Commitment gives stability to life. Does your commitments really reflect your values? Secondly, trust gives peace to life. The word trust, believe, obey, faith, it all comes from that same Greek word. How do we develop trust? How do you become a person of greater faith? You've got to learn to release things to God, palms down. Now, you've heard that before. You say, what do you mean? Because a lot of times we say, God, I'm releasing the situation to you, palms up. But when we release it, palms up, we are still in control. We're playing God. And if God doesn't do it the way we want, we take it back. And so you see, when you say, God, I'm giving it to you, but you hang on, the result is increased stress, ulcers, worry, and high blood pressure. Or you can trust God and release it to him, palms down, which means you got to let it go. You can no longer get it back and be in control and play God. You have got to let God be in control. That's hard to do. But when we do that, the result is peace and contentment. The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 3. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Circle the word all, because that's the struggle for us as Christians. He's got some of our heart, but he doesn't have all of our heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Means we, we don't know everything. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Let him be God, and he will make your paths straight. I want to ask you, what area of your life are you afraid to release to God? Are you afraid to release your spouse or your friends or your career or even your children? Mike Bro, who is a pastor friend of mine from Kentucky, tells a story about how difficult it was for he and his wife to trust God when it came to their teenage daughter. You see, when his daughter Jody was 18, she had just graduated from high school, she said, Mom and Dad, I want to make my life count and I don't want to go to college right away. You see, a few years earlier, the family had gone to Haiti on a short-term mission trip, 
And Jody said she wanted to go back and work in Haiti with the poor and orphan children for a year instead of going to college. And so Mike said he quickly reminded his daughter that Haiti was AIDS-infested, voodoo-controlled, and one of the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. She said, I know that, Dad, but that's something I still want to do with this year of my life. And so they got everything ready. He took her to the airport to fly to Haiti. And he said as he went back and sat in the car, he was reminded of a conversation that he and his wife had had with God just two years earlier. Because, you see, their daughter, Jody, was a rebellious teenager. She was out of control, and they didn't know what to do with her. And so they prayed and said, God, she's your kid, and we release her completely to you to use her life however you want to. You know, on all of our campuses today, there's probably some of you that may be praying that same prayer. You're saying there's a situation in our family and our life that's really out of control, and God, we don't know what to do, so we're going to release total control for you to work in that person's life. So Jody, on the plane, went to Haiti. She was in a very remote area of Haiti with only occasional email to communicate to her family, but one night, her parents received this email from her. It said this, Mom and Dad, tonight was the most phenomenal night of my life. Someone came and got me in the middle of the night to help deliver a baby. They called me because they had earlier seen me with a nurse and thought I was a nurse. But I don't know how to deliver babies. I just assisted once. I found myself in the middle of this hut in Haiti thinking, I'm 18 years old in a third world country in the middle of a jungle by myself with a flashlight and a screaming naked pregnant woman lying on the dirt floor and I'm going to have to deliver her baby. God, what am I doing here? To make matters worse, a visitor walked in the hut she was dressed in the blue and red wardrobe of a voodoo witch doctor. She began to chant evil things against me. She stopped and began to rub oil on the woman's head and stomach. I didn't know what to do. So I just looked back at her and started singing, Our God is an awesome God. He reigns in heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. And she said, I sang it over and over. And the voodoo woman quickly grabbed her stuff and ran out of the hut. And then I knew that this little baby boy was going to be born with the blessing of God and not the curse of Satan. Mike and his wife, as they were reading that email, he said he thought to himself, first of all, this, Jody, what in the world are you doing in a hut with a voodoo woman? Get on a plane as quick as you can and come home. We've got pizza and ice cream and a warm bed waiting for you. And then he said he stopped, and in the next breath he said, way to go, Jody. Your mom and I are so proud of you. You see, two years earlier, when Mike and his wife prayed to God and released their rebellious daughter to him, they had no idea of how God was going to use her to impact the life of a little boy in Haiti. Listen carefully. For many of us as parents, we try to control our children's lives. We try to plan their future without asking God what he thinks is best for their future. I want to repeat that. If we're not careful, even as Christian parents, we try to control our children's life and we try to plan their future without asking God what he thinks is best. That's where trust comes in. Can we as Christians release palms down those situations and people we love to our heavenly Father knowing that our heavenly Father knows best? You see, commitment gives stability to life. Trust gives peace to life. And thirdly, delight gives momentum to life. Why is it when you see Christians, they often walk around with long, sad faces? It makes you think they've been baptized in dill pickle juice. You see, if we're not careful, it's because we tend to take ourselves too seriously. We need to relax and yet take God very seriously. I believe laughter is good for the soul. Studies show that laughter actually adds years to your life. So if you're at CCV today, I hope we can laugh. Let me share with you that some of you sent this to me, and I'm going to read it. If you don't like it, send me something else, all right? Uh, it's it's how, do you, how do you shower like a woman and how do you shower like a man? Here's what it says. How to shower like a woman. Take off clothing and place it in a laundry hamper. Walk to the bathroom wearing a long robe. If you see your husband along the way, cover up exposed areas. Look at your womanly physique in the mirror. Take mental note to do more sit-ups and leg lifts. Get in the shower. 
Use washcloth, long loofah, wide loofah, and pumice stone. Wash your hair once with cucumber and sage shampoo with 43 added vitamins. Wash your hair again to make sure it's clean. Condition your hair with grapefruit mint conditioner. Wash your face with crushed apricot facial scrub for 10 minutes. Wash rest of body with ginger nut and Jaffa cake body wash. Rinse conditioner off of your hair. Shave your legs and armpits. Rinse off. Turn off shower. Squeegee off all wet surfaces in shower. <laughs> Spray mold spots with Tylex. Get out of shower and dry with towel the size of a small country. <laughs> Wrap hair in super absorbent towel. Return to bedroom wearing long robe and head a towel on head. If you see your husband along the way, cover up any exposed areas. Well, at least that's how a woman showers. How, how does a man shower? Well, a man, take off clothes while sitting on the edge of the bed and leave them in a pile. Walk naked to the bathroom. If you see your wife along the way, shake your body making that woo-woo sound. <laughs> Look at your manly physique in the mirror. Get in the shower, wash your face, wash your armpits, blow your nose in your hands, and let the water <laughs> rinse them off. Wash your hair, make a shampoo mohawk. Rinse off and get out of the shower. Partially dry off. Fail to notice the water on the floor because the curtain was hanging out of the tub the whole time. <laughs> Leave shower curtain open. Leave the wet mat on the floor and the light and fan on. Return to bedroom with towel around waist. If you pass your wife, take towel off, shake your body, and make that <laughs> woo-woo sound again. And then throw the wet towel on the bed. Well, isn't it good to laugh? That's what church is all about. That's what the Christian life is all about. We need to find joy in life. Delight and laughter brings momentum in life. And delighting in the Lord allows us to see how the things we've committed and trusted God to, we can see how he's working in our lives. Jesus and his disciples were together. Luke 24 tells it this way. When he led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, that was just a couple short miles from Jerusalem. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Meaning, Jesus was, was uh, buried. He was crucified. He was buried. He rose from the grave. He is now spending time with them before he ascends into heaven. And so he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Or can I say, they returned with great momentum. Why? Jesus was who he claimed to be. Jesus was the only son of God. Jesus was the only way to God. He was the resurrection and the life who conquered death and forgave their sins. And so they returned to Jerusalem with passion about their mission because his mission was now their mission. Go to heaven and take as many people with them as they can. You see, knowing your purpose in life, I believe that's what gives us passion that's what gives us energy. That's what gives us momentum. And so I want to ask you on all of our campuses, are you enjoying life? Are you enjoying your marriage, your career, your family? Are you doing what God wants you to do? The joy of the Lord is our strength. As Christians, we saw in the Lord there all the time. It's the Lord that gives us the momentum to face life struggles. It's the Lord that gives us the momentum to enjoy life a day at a time. Commitment gives stability to life. Trust gives peace to life. Delight gives momentum to life. And rest gives perspective to life. Rest before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Or, or another translation says, be still and wait patiently for the Lord. I don't know about you, but is there anybody on all of our campuses that say, God, I wish we could just skip that part? I don't know about you. Waiting patiently is hard for me. Oh, I want to trust God and make commitments, but, but I really want him to hurry up and answer my prayers and get things done. You see, the Lord answers our prayers, but God often answers our prayers with a yes, a no, or a wait. And waiting is often the hardest answer to our prayers. Because waiting and being still and resting gives us a different perspective. This is probably something maybe you can relate to, but the image I want to put in your mind for this rest and be still and wait patiently for the Lord, I want you to picture yourself in a rocking chair in a small town in the Midwest. We don't have those in, in the valley that much at all. 
But in a small town, I remember growing up, you could drive down the streets, and there was the front porch. And people were in the front porch in their rocking chair, and you'd go by, and they'd wave at you. You might stop and engage in conversation. If you're walking down the street, you would always talk and be involved. If the kids were playing, they were waving and talking to you, and you'd sit on the front porch, and you, you would rock. You see, when you're on the front porch in a rocking chair, life slows down. It gives you a totally different perspective on life than when you're going down the freeway at 70 miles an hour. It's a different perspective. It's hard for us in the culture in which we live to find times to rest and slow down and be patient and trust God. Psalm chapter 40, David says this, I waited patiently for the Lord. There it is. I waited patiently. He turned to me, heard my cry, lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. What David is saying is what we have to do. He says, you pray, and once you pray, you rest and wait, and God will hear your cry and answer your prayers and set you up for success. Listen, God is worth waiting for. All of our campuses, repeat that with me. God is worth waiting for. Now, let me hear it like you mean it. God is worth waiting for. You know what we need to do? We need to be still and rest. And I want to challenge you on all of our campuses to find one hour a day when you can rest and be still and listen to God. It might be an hour It might be two 30-minute blocks. It might be four 15-minute blocks, but it'll totally change your perspective on life. Or I want to challenge you to take one day a week and be still and be quiet. That doesn't mean we're we're at the lake, the mountains, doing all our thing. It means you've got to spend time with the Lord in worship, and you've got to spend some time in rest and reflection and say, God, what do you want? Or maybe it's one week a year. Isn't it interesting And I'm so proud of the parents on our campuses. We had a record summer camp experience because you made it a priority to send your kids to a week of summer camp and their their Christian walk just goes to the next level each and every week. You know what hit me this week? Maybe, just maybe, we need to begin to think of an adult camp for a week where we can get you out of the fast-paced culture you live in and we could take you away for a week. And that whole week would be focused on worship and reflection and quiet and say, God, what do we need to do to go to the next level? God's worth waiting for. Notice the cycle in this psalm to find balance in your life. We make commitments to God. And those commitments have to reflect our values. And then once we make those commitments, we release them palms down to God in trust. And we say, God, I don't know what's going to happen here, but you're God, and I'm going to trust you because you know best. And we release those commitments to him. Then we step back and we see God work as we've quit playing God and we've let him be in control, and then we delight because we say, God, the longer I let you in charge, I can really see what you're doing. And then we're able to go to bed at night and rest and find peace and be still and listen to God's voice. And then what happens? We get up and we commit more to him. We trust him more. We delight more. We rest easier. We make more commitments. And that's the way I believe this circle of balance works. And that's the way we grow in our faith. I want to ask you, is your life out of balance today? Do you feel like you're about to go over the edge? Then here's the takeaway. Here's here's what I want you to do. What is one change you need to make so that God is your top priority? All the campuses, don't check out, write something in here. What's the, not five changes, let's just, let's go for one, one change that you want to make so that God's your top priority. I didn't say God is a priority, God is our top priority, because all four of these things to bring balance, it all goes back to the Lord. And maybe then, the one change you need to make is to make Him your top priority, or maybe it's reevaluate your spiritual commitments. You're saying, you know what? I've been closer to coming 10 times a year than 35 or 40 times a year. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to reevaluate my commitments to consistent weekend worship, and I'm going to get plugged into a neighborhood group because I know my friends will help me go to the next level. 
Or maybe you're going to step back and do what my wife and I had to do years ago and reevaluate our children's activities. Not only do we have to say you're going to each pick one thing you're going to do, but we had to make sure that they weren't so consumed with that 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 took priority over church and youth group. Or maybe for you it's releasing control to God. Maybe it's like Mike Bro and his wife. You've got maybe a rebellious child or a person that is a part of your life and you're really trying to control them and it's not working and you're saying, okay, God, it's your kid. It's your man. It's your woman. God, I, I release them to you and I'm gonna trust you that you'll use their life any way that you want to. CCB, let's be intentional about finding, finding balance in our lives so we don't go over the edge and lose our marriage, our lives, our family, our career. What does it profit us if we gain the whole world and yet lose our very souls? Let's pray. Dear God, most of us on all of the campuses, we have accepted you as our Lord and Savior. We, we made a decision to put you first. And for those that haven't made that decision, I pray right now that that would be their prayer. Lord, come into my life and, and be first. Lord, we ask for forgiveness because we have not honored the commitment that we've made to put you first, to be in your proper place. We've allowed other commitments and other distractions to crowd you out of where you need to be. And that's why our lives are so out of balance. So we come today to recommit ourselves to you, saying, Lord, we're going to return you to your rightful place. We're going to trust in you with all of our heart because we know that you will crown our efforts with success and bring us balance in life. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.